So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today is part two of the series that I posted the other day. Uh, three guys, one hammer. So today is part two. If you haven't seen part one, you kind of need to watch that because this one won't make any sense. I'll link it up here if you want to go and watch it. Do that then come back here and let's go. Quickly before I get into it, I just wanna let you know that I have fully started up my second channel once again. I had a little bit of a break over Christmas, but I'm back on there. So if you wanna go and subscribe, it's just called Eleanor. I'll link it down below in the description. I would love to see you over there. So today we are gonna be talking about, of course, the three guys, one hammer case, but today is more on the capture of the Dnipropetrovsk maniacs. But before we get into it, I just want to thank our sponsor for making this video possible, Skillshare. For over a year now, if there's anything that I'm ever struggling with or like a skill that I want to improve on or get better at, I run straight to Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring online classes for you to take on a range of subjects. I have done so many. There's things in creativity, you know, music, drawing, anything like that. There's business, there's lifestyle, there's productivity classes. I feel like now more than ever we're all looking for some kind of structure in our lives whether that's you know just something to do, just something to pass the boredom or you know improving a skill that you already have, getting more into a hobby or starting a whole new project like a work project maybe. And Skillshare is perfect for helping you work towards your own personal goals that you might have. I've particularly loved Skillshare for focusing on self-care recently. Personally I am finding the third law lockdown in the UK pretty hard. <laughs> this one's the hardest one for me so far and so I've loved using Skillshare to look after not only my physical health but my mental health which is so important at the moment. One class that I've been loving recently on Skillshare is Plants at Home, Unlift Your Spirit and Your Space by Christopher Griffin, Plant Queen. My little mate right here, she's off camera right now because the tree is absolutely dead. She's seen better days, honestly, she is dead. And so as soon as I saw this class on Skillshare, I ran straight to it because I've never been good at looking after plants. You guys think I am because of the tree in my background, but trust me, it's not, <laughs> it's not good. And in this class, Christopher teaches you what plants are good for your space, how to look after those plants and care for them, and how to just make your space, whether it's your bedroom, your living room, your office, just a lot more bright and happy and positive. I've personally loved it, and I know that you guys will love Skillshare as well, and they have been so kind to give you guys a special little discount. The first 1,000 of you guys that click the link down below in the description of this video will get a free premium membership trial of Skillshare for free. I said free twice, but that's because it's free, by the way. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. So what are you waiting for? Go click the link down below in the description. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the case. Just a quick warning though, before we do get into part two of this case, it does include themes of animal abuse and the killing of animals. And I know that that's something a lot of you guys struggle with in my videos. So I am gonna try and give warnings on videos where that pops up. So if that's not for you, if you have to click out of this video, don't worry. I'll be back as soon as I can with another video. Okay, so now before we get into part two I'm just gonna give a quick summary of part one and we'll get straight into it. Sorry. It's been, it's been a long one The setting is Dnipro, Ukraine in 2007 in the space of 21 days 21 dead bodies have appeared on the streets of the city and all of the victims seem to have the same injuries they were all brutally beaten with what seemed to be a large heavy object and their faces were pretty much unrecognizable, every single one. And there wasn't a clear victim profile at this point. All the victims seemed so different to each other. There were men, there were women, there were children, there were all ages, all different professions. They seemed to be all from different walks of life. It didn't seem as though the killer was particularly targeting you know, a specific type of person. However, as the killings went on, police realized what these victims did have in common. And that was that each one of them was vulnerable in some way when they were killed, whether they were a homeless person asleep on a bench and unable to defend themselves, whether they were a woman who was kind of small and petite or whether it was a drunk man or a child, you know, there was some way in which the killer must have felt like they were able to overpower each victim. There was some kind of physical advantage that the killer must have had. So this made police believe it was probably a man 
that was doing these killings, an older man. And there had been a couple of survivors of these attacks. One particular survivor that tried to help police in this case as much as he possibly could was a 14 year old boy whose best friend was murdered right in front of him. And this boy told police that it was two young-ish men that had attacked him and his friend. Now this changed police's mind of what kind of killer they thought they had on their hands. This boy gave as much information as he possibly could, but because this was such a traumatic event and he was hiding for most of it, he couldn't tell police much more than that they were maybe in their early 20s, late teens, and they were boys. They were just young boys. Two of them as well. So now police knew that they were looking for two people, two attackers. They also knew that the killers were stealing items from their victims, phones, money, any kind of jewelry that they had on them. And so they decided to get in contact with local pawn shops in Dnipro to see if any of these stolen items had been sold to the pawn shops because then they'd easily be able to track a killer. And that was when police finally got their big break in this case. One of these pawn shops identified that they'd been sold a lot of the items that seemed to have been missing from these victims. And so when they got in contact with police about a particular phone, that they'd just been sold. Police were able to track the GPS on this phone and when the pawn shop owner switched on the phone, they got a signal. So this was confirmed to be one of the victim's phones. So now that pawn shop owner had the name of the person that sold them the phone and it only makes sense that that would be the killer. I hope that makes sense. It's a confusing story to tell, but now the pawn shop owner could give police the name or names of the people that had sold them these stolen items. On July 27th, 2007, police received these names. It was three boys named Victor Sayenko, Igor Soprunyuk, and Alexander Hanza. So that day, police went to all of the boys' individual houses and arrested them. And I mean, you can barely call it an arrest. They weren't read their rights. They were given no explanation, no warrant, absolutely nothing. Police just stormed in their houses, beat them, and put them in the back of a police car and took them to the station. They didn't tell them anything. And when police arrived at Alexander Hanza's home in particular, they actually caught him in the process of flushing certain items down the toilet. And these items were the missing phones, the missing jewelry, some money, you know, very incriminating things. So while the boys were taken to the police station for questioning, some other officers went and spoke to their parents to try and get a better idea of who these three adolescent murder suspects were. This was very unusual for three young boys to be implicated in something so serious, 21 kills in 21 days. So the Sayenko family, Victor Sayenko's family, consisted of a computer engineer father who also worked in public prosecutions. So is that a lawyer or someone that works within the law? Someone very high up anyway. And his mother was a stay at home mother. And the Sopronyuk family, Igor Sopronyuk, his mother was also a stay at home mother. And both of their mothers were very, loving, very doting, very adoring. They babied their children to a degree. And Igor's father was a pilot, but not just any pilot. He was the pilot for the president of the Ukraine. He transported the president everywhere. So these were both very high up fathers. But Alexander Hansa was quite the opposite of the other two boys. He actually lived with just his mother in a poorer part of town after his father died but we'll get more into that later. So all of the boys were born in early 1988. Victor and Igor were both rather rich. They were middle class. Of course, their parents had good jobs, like I said. And so they lived in a good area. They went to a good school and that's actually where they met each other in school and became best friends. Victor introduced Igor to his friend, Alexander Hansa. Now, Alexander, like I said, he was working class, whereas the other boys were middle class, which was met with some judgment from Igor at first. However, eventually the boys became a three, but it was always Victor and Igor and then Alexander. 
they weren't they weren't a full three it was kind of like victor and igor were best friends and then alexander was their other friend and alexander's life was very different to the other two boys he didn't live in a very good place in town his apartment building where he lived with his mother was actually infested with rats and not just any rats rats the size of dogs. His father died when he was very young, so he didn't have a father figure in his life. It was just him and his mum struggling for money all his life. But despite the so obvious differences in backgrounds between Igor and Victor and Alexander, all of the boys got on pretty well. You know, they were interested in all the same things and they all came from happy families, you know? Even though Alexander was less well off than the other boys, doesn't mean that his mother loved him any less. They struggled financially, but he didn't have a bad upbringing because of it. The boys were all equally loved and supported by their parents and there were no kind of family red flags, no history of crime, no history of mental illness. They came from really good backgrounds. The boys were described by their families as handsome. They all got girls, you know, they didn't have any issues with socialization. They weren't outcasts, they were, you know, they made friends easy. Their parents said that they were intelligent, they were kind, they got good grades, they were well behaved. A lot of their parents even mentioned that they love animals and they care for animals. One of them even had a pet hamster in his room, which you'll later see why this is so odd to me. But anyway, they liked to spend a lot of their time together just hanging out on the streets because they couldn't really do much more. You know, the streets were kind of like a social setting for them. As opposed to going round to one of their houses, they would all just meet up on the streets and just walk around and just get up to no good. They were seeking some kind of thrill and at first this manifested in vandalism. They began throwing stones at houses and cars and trains and they originally got into a little bit of police trouble for this. It was just a warning but that was the start of what was to become a lot of police trouble in their life. And then one day these little petty crimes eventually escalated to theft. One day when Victor and Igor were out without Alexander, Alexander wasn't there, they actually stole a bike. Now this ended in the boys being fined. The police went round to their houses, spoke with their parents, the boys were fined and they were given a warning. And following this, Victor's parents actually banned him from seeing and spending time with Igor because it seemed that Igor was the main perpetrator, the main influence in this. Victor was a very impressionable person. You'll see this a lot in this case that whatever Igor says, Victor's just like, oh yeah, that'd be a good idea. But it's never Victor's idea in the first place. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't make anything better. He still took part in all of these, but it was like Igor was the mastermind and Victor was his right hand man and he was willing to do whatever Igor wanted, no matter how serious and horrific it is. So anyway, Victor is banned from seeing Igor, but of course this doesn't last very long because the parents can't really control what the kids do out on the street, you know? And before long, the trio were back together. As they got older, Igor and Victor found themselves being the target of bullies, older boys that would bully them. And it wasn't necessarily a personal thing to Igor and Victor. These older boys literally just bullied anyone in the younger years that they that they thought that they could. Anyone that they thought they had power over, they would do it. And Igor and Victor became one of their victims. Now, these bullies used a lot of a lot of different tactics <laughs> to any of the bullies I've ever heard in my life. So they would identify their victims' weaknesses. So say if a kid was really scared of spiders, they would use spiders to bully them. So they would go and find a spider in the schoolyard and like throw it at the kid and taunt him with his own fears. And Victor and Igor became increasingly worried that their fear of heights was one day gonna be used against them by these boys. And they knew that they had to do something about it. They had to cure this phobia before the bullies could get to them. Into the mid 2000s, Igor and Victor both got a computer at their house and this was brand new, you know, this was as they were just coming out and just getting popular. They were fascinated by what computers could do, you know, you could type in anything and get an article on anything. So one night, the two of them were round at one of their houses and they decided that they were gonna try and use the computer 
to come up with a way to get over their phobia of heights. So they searched online how to overcome phobias and they found an article that said in order to cure a phobia, you have to face it head on. And the boys thought that this was a great idea and so they made a plan that one day after school that week, they were both gonna meet up and they were gonna go to the top of one of the biggest buildings in their town. And this building was like 15 stories high. They went all the way to the top, to the roof of the building, and they went out and dangled themselves over the railings by their hands. Their feet were just swinging 15 stories high and they said that they weren't gonna move, they weren't gonna get off until they no longer felt scared. So the boys were there dangling from these railings for hours, but eventually it cured them. When the boys no longer felt scared, they got up onto the top of the building and suddenly they weren't scared of heights anymore. And from this point on, they felt powerful. They felt like they'd just tamed their only weakness. So now they had no weaknesses. They'd fixed that part of their brain that they deemed as weak. And so now not only did they feel more powerful than the bullies, but they wanted to become them. So Igor and Victor began doing exactly what they watched those bullies doing to other kids this whole time. And they began bullying the smaller kids. Igor and Victor became the bullies. It was all about the power dynamic for Victor and Igor. They, they liked to have this power over the younger kids that they never had before. They were the powerless ones when they were being bullied. And now they wanted to bully other people to feel like they had you know, some kind of higher strength than they did. And this power dynamic, of course, because it's not specific to these children that they were bullying, that means it's easy to transfer this power dynamic onto other things. And eventually this transferred onto animals. So the way that this came about was because Igor and Victor had cured their phobia of heights now, they were hanging out with Alexander one day and they were bragging to him that now they felt so powerful that they had tamed that weaker part of their brain that was scared of something. And Alexander confided in them that, you know, he was scared of blood. He couldn't do blood. He was, you know, very squeamish. And so Victor and Igor knew exactly the way to cure him. They knew that he had to face his fear head on. So from then on, the boys began abducting domestic and wild animals. So any cats or dogs or anything that they saw on the street and they would take them somewhere and torture, kill and mutilate these poor little animals. But that wasn't even the extent of it. This sadism and this evil only grew when the boys began filming what they were doing to these animals. They would record and take pictures on their phone. And some of these videos that they would take of them torturing and murdering small animals would last up to like 40 minutes. 40 minutes of continuous torture and then murder. One video that people discuss in reference to this case, now this is rather graphic, so if you do wanna skip over this, then, you know, please do because it's, it is awful to hear about. And in this particular video, this is one of the longer videos that the boys did, upwards of 40 minutes, they abducted, tortured and killed a small white kitten. They nailed it to a cross, squirted hot glue in its mouth and then eventually shot it with rubber, rubber bullet, rubber pellets until it died. And then when it died, they skinned it on camera. Now this bit is debated. I don't know if this is 100% true or if they just kind of talked about it or thought about it. But some sources say that they would then take these pictures and videos that they'd taken of them torturing and killing these animals and post them online on gore websites. And the captions that are rumored to be on these posts were very bragging. You know, they were talking about how this was their trophy of the day. They seemed very proud of what they'd done. And some of the more infamous pictures from this case, so that's one of the infamous videos one of the infamous pictures from this case, literally, if you search these boys on Google, this is one of the pictures that comes up, is them standing in front of a tree that they'd hung a dog from. They'd hung 
and killed this dog and then taken a selfie in front of it. It has been blurred out in a lot of the pictures on Google Images. Obviously, you can tell why because that's awful. But there's so many. Like, of course, as part of my research, I had to like go through all these pictures and stuff to find pictures to put in the videos. And there's just so many. There's so many different dogs that they'd done this with, cats, you know, different different animals. And it's hard to believe that these are the same boys that were described as animal lovers by their parents. One of them even had a pet hamster that he kept in his room, which I said at the time I find it so odd because, you know, what distinguishes that pet hamster to all these other animals that they were abducting and killing from the streets in their minds? You know, one of them is a pet and one of them is something that they can kill. I also find it quite interesting that they never once harmed this pet hamster, you know? He was quite a good owner to this hamster. Well, supposedly. So I find it really interesting that he can distinguish between animals that he likes and wants to care for and ones that they don't. So in these gore forums and websites and stuff, it was mainly Igor that was interested in them because he was, you know, like I said, he was the mastermind, but a lot of the ideas that these boys would do were originally Igor's ideas that he would get from these gore websites. And the things that he would search up online just kept getting darker and darker. He would look at mafia killings, like videos of mafia killings and shootings. He would search up terrorist beheadings, beheading videos, you know, the ones that used to go around, you know, to make people scared of these terrorist organizations, he would seek them out. He would forward the links to his friend Victor and he would wanna talk about them and he would be really interested in them. And through this internet use, of course, gore websites weren't the only thing that he would do. He would go on all sorts of dark forums and through this, he actually learned a lot more about Hitler and the Nazis and eventually became a fan. Igor especially liked that he shared the same birthday as Adolf Hitler and he would brag to a lot of people about it. He was very proud. He would often draw the toothbrush moustache on himself and spray paint swastikas on walls outside. He would sometimes even draw swastikas on the walls in the blood of the animals that they would kill. And then he would take pictures in front of them with his fake little mustache drawn on. He read all these different Nazi books and he kept them at home. And for some reason, his parents never cottoned on or, you know, realized what was happening. Or if they did realize, they didn't care. So now the boys were reaching around 18, 19 years old and they had been in slight trouble with the police for a number of things over their teenage years, surprisingly nothing to do with the animal abuse, but for other things like the vandalism, harassment, beating up younger boys, and unbelievably, they would get off on every single charge or every single issue that the police had with them, they would come and speak with the boys and just let them off with a warning every single time. And that is believed to have been because of the boys' powerful, fathers. Both of them had very high up, very well-connected fathers, shall we say? And these were serious crimes that the boys were just simply getting warnings for. I mean, Igor once beat up a small child and stole his bike and took it all the way home and the boy's parents saw this happen and campaigned with the police to, you know, get some charges on this 18-year-old boy that had just beaten up their small child. And, you know, police were just like, we've given him a warning. Around this same time in their late teens, Victor Sienko actually got a girlfriend. And now it's unknown quite how much this girl knew about things. I think she knew quite a bit, but she said to police that she didn't really know anything. I think it takes a particular type of person to be in a romantic relationship with someone that abuses and murders animals on on film. When the boys graduated school, they started to get jobs. And I say they, but it was just Victor. Victor got a job as a part-time security guard, whereas Igor didn't want to work. He would just kind of chill at home and just go on these websites. And like, he didn't really have any, any drive, any, anything. He didn't want to do anything. He was fine living off his family's money. Alexander, he bounced between jobs. He never really kept anything, um, but he could get jobs. And now even though the boys 
not Alexander, but Victor and Igor, even though they had rich parents, their parents weren't exactly willing to just let them live off their money for the rest of their lives. They did want their sons to get jobs, especially Igor's parents, because he wasn't doing anything. And so his father got him a green Daewoo car. <laughs> um, for his graduation, for a graduation present. And in 2007, all three of the boys would just go driving around in this car all day, every day, like into the evening, into the early hours of the morning. This was early 2007. And eventually Igor's father said to him, look, you, you're gonna have to get a job. And Igor said, I do have a job. I run a taxi service. Now he didn't, he didn't run a taxi service, but his father couldn't argue that because he knew that his son was out in his car all day. So, I mean, he just accepted that his son had a taxi. So he was running this unofficial, unregistered taxi service. He got a little thing to put on the top of his car. Um, but of course he wasn't registered anywhere. So if anything was to happen in his taxi, taxi, then no reports could really be made because it's not real taxi. So the boys decided in order to get some money, they were going to start robbing people. They were gonna pretend like they were actually a taxi service. They were gonna pick someone up and then once they got this person in the car, they were gonna drive them out to the middle of nowhere, beat them, steal their money and then dump them on the side of the road without a phone, without any way of getting home. Now, all three boys would take part in this. Alexander, who needed the money the most, never really liked that he had to do this. He felt like he had to because he needed the money desperately. He knew that morally this was wrong and it didn't sit right with him, but he did it anyway. Whereas Victor and Igor, they didn't really need the money because they could live off their parents. But the thing that drove them to do this was that they just enjoyed inflicting terror upon other people. So they would do this for a couple of months. I think they started around the January in 2007. They were doing it all through January, all through February. And then on March 1st, 2007, Alexander Hansa had a breaking point with this. The robberies at this point had escalated to armed robberies. Somehow one of them had gotten hold of a gun and they had started pulling this gun on their victims and Alexander didn't like that. He felt like now this was another level, another level that he wasn't comfortable with. I think he sensed a kind of ulterior motive from his friends. At first it was for the money and Alexander felt like he had to do it for the money, but now he felt like his friends were just enjoying watching these people scream and get scared. And so in early March of 2007, Alexander told his friends that he no longer wanted any part of this and he wasn't gonna commit these armed robberies anymore. And Victor and Igor said, okay, but we're gonna still do them. And this continued all the way into the summer of 2007. And this brings us back to the timeline. All three boys are now in the police station on suspicion of 21 murders in the city. Now, Alexander Hansa was adamant that he had no part in any of the murders. He didn't kill anyone, he didn't watch anyone be murdered. He said that yes, he had handled and sold some of the items from the murder victims, but he didn't fully realize what he was doing. He said that he was given these items from Igor and Victor to sell. And of course, with him being on such a low wage, his single mother's wage, and needing the money so badly, he never really questioned where these items were coming from. He had a good idea. He thought they were coming from the armed robberies. He never expected them to have been coming from murder victims. A lot of people believe that Alexander knew that the murders were going on and he knew that he was selling items from murder victims, but because he didn't have a part in the murder, he thought that he could lie and say that he didn't know that the murders were happening. Does that make sense? A lot of people think that Alexander knew a lot more than he was letting on here. Later in the case, the public saw a video get leaked from the interrogation footage of Alexander Hansa. So this first day that he was brought into the police station and questioned, he was videotaped being beaten by the police and in this video, you can literally find it on YouTube. He is, he's so spaced out. You can see he's got like a black eye, his face is bruised. And a lot of people believe that that is because Alexander Hansa was the only one of the three boys without an influential or powerful or rich father 
that could sway the police. The police in Ukraine are, or were, I don't want to make too many claims, but corrupt, especially at this point. I don't know if it's still that way, but you know, in this case, they are very corrupt at multiple different points. So Alexander Hanza in his interrogation was being beaten. He was very spaced out. He was, you know, he was abused. Whereas Igor and Victor didn't have a single scratch on them. But regardless, it was the two of them that actually cracked and confessed. The first was Victor Sayenko, the, the kind of sidekick of the pairing. He said that he had acted alone in the killings and then he later changed that and said that Igor was there when he committed the killings, but Igor had no part in it. Police kind of knew that he wasn't telling the truth, obviously, they, they knew that Igor had to have been involved and that was confirmed when Igor also confessed later on. It actually seemed as though Igor was the most violent one in the killings, although both of them had played a huge part, both of them had been very much involved in each and every murder, but Igor just had a lot more of a depraved mindset and role in the killings. He enjoyed it. He did it for the thrill, he did it for the experience, he didn't do it for any other reason other than he wanted to kill. So in their interviews with the police, in their confessions, the boys recounted the whole series of events from their first murder right through to their last. So I'm gonna go through all that right now. It's a bit patchy. Some of the killings they don't really say anything about. Some of them they say a lot about. So they were asked how many people they killed and Victor replied, I don't know, maybe 19. And when asked why he did it, Victor said he didn't know. However, a few hours later, he then changed that motive to money. He needed the money. But then he also followed that up saying Igor, well, he just liked to kill. One of them was also quoted saying in police custody that they'd read a book that said, the more lives that you take on earth, the more respect you will get in heaven. But I mean, I think that's just kind of something that one of the boys just said, just like an off comment. I think the main motive, the motive that everyone believes in this case is that the boys just wanted to kill. They just liked it. They just enjoyed inflicting terror on people and taking lives. So they say that their first killing was Yekaterina Ilchenko, the first body that did appear in this case. So there wasn't any more that police didn't know about. The boys said that they were just on a walk that night. That's an exact quote. They were just on a walk. The actual reason why they were out that night isn't known. Maybe they were just on a walk, but they took a hammer with them. So who knows? Were they actually just on a walk just to go on a walk? Why do you take a hammer on a walk? Anyway, they were just on a walk that night when they saw Yekaterina walking towards them alone. Yekaterina was less than a hundred meters away from her apartment door when she passed the boys in the street and as they did Igor spun round and swung the hammer and hit her in the side of the head. So it was kind of like she was hit from behind so they crossed that way and as soon as they got past each other he swung round and hit her. So I don't think she saw anything happening to her. I think she just felt it. There was no verbal communication. There was no trigger. There was, there was nothing. She was simply just walking and then all of a sudden she was hit. He didn't say anything to her. The two of them bludgeoned her until they were sure that she was dead. And then when they were satisfied, they moved on. They wasted no time in finding their next victim, which was the homeless man, Roman Tatovich. He was asleep on a bench, literally just around the corner from where Yekaterina was killed. So the boys had literally killed Yekaterina, walked around the corner, gone into this park, they were looking for a new victim, and then they found someone asleep on a bench. And they knew that he would be very easy to kill because he wasn't gonna fight back, he was asleep. Roman had been drinking that night, he drank most nights and he'd actually passed out on the bench, not just fallen asleep, he'd passed out. So he didn't wake up during the attack, he didn't, he, he didn't know that any of this ever happened. And this park bench was actually directly opposite where Victor's father worked as the public prosecution uh, guy. I'm sorry, I don't know what that job's called. But I think that says a lot about these boys, that his father worked in in the law, worked in the legal field, and he was willing to murder someone 
across from where his father worked. I mean, it just shows that these boys, they've never been punished a day in their life. The police have never punished them. They think they can get away with anything. They think their fathers will get them off of anything. But anyway, the boys said that they approached Roman Tatovich as he was asleep on the bench and they beat him with a hammer and killed him while he was asleep. He didn't move. The boys didn't give much more information about the attempted murder that they tried the next day or their third or fourth kills. The next kind of bulk of the information that they gave police was in connection with their fifth, sixth and seventh victims. The night that they went on that really big rampage and they did like four in one night. Victor claims that he had been round at his girlfriend's house that night, just chilling with her and then Igor gave him a call and said that he was gonna come and pick him up. And their plan that night was to go out in this green car that Igor's father got him and do what they normally did, these armed robberies. Their plan, I don't think, was to kill anyone that night. Their plan was literally just to pick up maybe three, four people and do these usual unofficial taxi journeys and then just take them out into the middle of nowhere, rob them and ditch them. However, at some point, the plan changed. At some point during the night, they must have seen the young army man named Igor um, walking home from his night out and they must have been able to tell that he was intoxicated and that he would have been an easy target and that was their fifth kill. And their sixth kill, their second of the night, actually came just minutes after they killed Igor. So again, they literally just carried on walking down the street, they went on to a new one and that was where they saw Yelena Shram just walking home from work. Now, at this point, Igor was hiding the hammer underneath his shirt. They would normally keep it in a plastic bag and keep the plastic bag on it when they would hit people with it. And he was hiding this up his shirt as he was walking towards Yelena, the, the weapon that he'd literally just murdered someone with on one street over and Yelena had no idea. Again, the two of them were walking towards each other and this time they didn't even get a chance to pass each other. This time, Igor just pulled the hammer out and launched towards her. So she saw everything that was about to happen. They said that Yelena fell down after the first blow and she was unresponsive already. So she was either knocked out or she was already killed. Igor said he then walked around to where her head was and continued just beating her over and over again until, like I said, her face was unrecognizable. He continued after she was very clearly dead. Her skull was smashed in. He could see her brain, but he kept going. Finally, when Igor was satisfied with this attack once again, he looked over and the boys noticed that Yelena had been carrying a bag and they thought, perfect, what's in this bag? The boys opened it, hoping to find something of value. However, in this bag, there was just a load of clothes. She'd just taken a change of clothes to work. And so they were kind of disappointed, but they just pulled these clothes out and used them to wipe the blood from their hands, from their faces, and from the murder weapon that had just killed Yelena. They were using her own clothes to wipe her own blood off of the weapon. When they were done, they grabbed all the clothes and Yelena's bag and they just threw it all in a nearby bin and just left her body on the ground and they continued on. Eventually, they walked down a few more streets and bumped into Valentina Hansa, who ended up being their seventh kill overall. And then eventually, when they'd killed all three of those people, they still weren't finished for the night. They decided to go back and find the car and drive to find a fourth victim. That was when they found themselves on that country lane where they drove past two 14-year-old boys on bikes. Andre and Vadim. In a split second, Igor and Victor drove past the boys and formulated a plan together to ambush both of the boys at the same time and try and get a double kill together. So they drove past them and parked a little bit further ahead and they both got out of the car and waited on either side. So the boys couldn't go anywhere where they wouldn't be caught by Igor and Victor. Just as the boys got close enough to the car, both Igor and Victor turned around and swung at them with their individual weapons. However, this didn't quite go to plan, as we know. They managed to knock both boys off of their bikes and Andre, who was Igor's victim, was rendered unconscious. Whereas Vadim, who was Victor's victim, the one that eventually survived, Vadim managed to get to his feet and run away and get away from 
the maniacs. Now, this infuriated Igor, who was still hitting Andre on the ground with a hammer. Andre was probably dead at this point, and Igor begins screaming at Victor to get back in the car and go and chase after the victim that he lost. He was saying that they couldn't let another witness get away because they'd left too many people alive at this point. This would have been their second attempted murder that they'd ended up leaving alive. So Victor got in the car and began driving up and down this country lane. And meanwhile, Vadim is hiding in the bushes, terrified for his life, watching as this car stalks the road looking for him. It must have been so terrifying. Eventually, Victor realized that he wasn't gonna find Vadim and so he returned to Igor and said, look, we need to get out of here because I'm not gonna find this guy. He's gonna be going to the police or going to someone. We need to get out. Igor gave Andre one last blow to the head and then he put the hammer in the boot of the car and the two men jumped in the car and drove away leaving Andre in the middle of the road where he later died. In the days following these killings and this attempted double murder that hadn't quite gone to plan, somehow Igor and Victor found out where Andre's funeral was going to be held. And they actually turned up to their own murder victim's funeral claiming to be friends from school. Now, the boys did this a lot with their killings. You'll see later on, they they liked to revel in it. They liked to watch the devastation that they had caused. They would go to their victim's funerals. They would go to their victim's grave sites. They liked to be a part of their killings for as long as they could. But some people believe that them appearing at Andre's funeral wasn't just to revel in their murder. Some people believe that they were actually looking for Vadim, the victim that they let get away. Now, I'm not 100% sure if I said this in part one, so I'll just say it again. Vadim's mother didn't actually let him go to Andre's funeral. His best friend that he watched get murdered in front of him because she felt like it would be too traumatic for him. And you know, maybe it's a good thing that he didn't go because who knows what would have happened if Victor and Igor had seen and recognised Vadim at the funeral? Would they have gone after him afterwards? Or, you know, would this case have been solved a lot sooner, perhaps? Because if Vadim had seen their faces at the funeral, maybe he would have been able to tell police. Either way, that wasn't the case. Now, Victor and Igor don't give much information about their next couple of murders. The next one that they talk openly about is the 11th murder. Now, this one is the infamous recorded murder that goes under the title Three Guys, One Hammer, and this is the murder of Sergei Yatsenko. They said that they started filming that day with the intention of finding and killing their next victim. So that was their full intention. When they hit record, they knew that they were gonna film a murder that day. So I'm gonna try and talk you through this video. Now, bear in mind, there's a few issues here. First of all, I didn't actually watch the video myself because I am not gonna do that to myself. I get traumatized enough with these videos as it is. So this information might not be 100% correct because I am not willing to fact check it myself. I've tried to fact check it as much as I can from other people's transcripts of this video. Also, there's the thing that they were speaking in Ukrainian and I do not speak that. And a lot of people that have watched the video also do not speak that. So the translations might be slightly off. Also, just the warning that this can get a little bit graphic. So maybe skip a little bit if you don't wanna listen. So the person that initially hit record was Victor and the video starts on Igor, who's just standing in the street in this country lane and he's talking to either the camera or Victor behind the camera and he says, we can stop a car like that. If it's a big stronger guy that gets out, we'll say there's no problem and let him go. But if it's a little guy, we'll say welcome with this. And then he pulls the hammer from a carrier bag that he was holding and laughs. He then told the camera how he would approach the victim and he's swinging the hammer around. He's putting it back in the bag. He's laughing through the whole thing. It's, I have actually seen this bit and it's really sinister. So this starting part of the video is just them kind of waiting for a victim to come along. So in the meantime, they're just talking about other things relating to their murder. They're talking about things that they hope to steal from a victim. They also place the camera on the top of the car, kind of leaning against the taxi sign. So it's kind of essentially on a tripod situation. So the two of them come into the frame and they're both pointing at different parts on the car, saying that they were bloodstains from different victims and they were both kind of arguing about which victim 
each blood stain had come from. For most of this video, it's Victor that's holding the camera on Igor, so you can see their power dynamic even here through this. And at one point, Victor holds up a pair of binoculars and holds the camera up to the lens, so it's kind of like the camera's looking through the binoculars, and he's just waiting to see if a victim, potential victim, comes down the road. And eventually he spotted one and he alerts Igor and the two boys, rather excitedly, start pacing the road. They're getting ready to commit their next murder. Igor turns to Victor behind the camera and says, if he's strong, you come help me kill him. And Victor replies, of course. So Igor walked to the other side of the road. Victor's still on this side by the camera and they waited as a man on a bike approached and this man was Sergei. As Sergei got in line with Igor who was on this side of the road, Igor lifted the hammer and took a swing at him while he was still riding the bike and knocked him straight to the floor. After this initial hit, Victor, who was still on the camera, runs over and kneels down to the body to try and get the best possible camera angle as Igor took another swing with the hammer and hit him once again. After he was hit twice with the hammer, the boys then grab Sergei's body and drag him into the woods on the side of the road. And this is when the real horror of this video begins. Once they were in there, the boys were laughing and they were taunting Sergei for his inability to scream or cry for help because like I said, he had that emergency surgery for his throat cancer and ever since then, he was barely able to talk. All he could do was a whisper. Now, of course, the boys didn't know this. They thought that he was whispering and unable to speak or scream because they'd just hit him and they thought that they'd injured him so bad that he couldn't speak when that wasn't the case. So Igor continues hitting Sergei with the hammer and around halfway through, Victor, still holding the camera in one hand, produced a screwdriver with the other one. He then records himself stabbing Sergei in the stomach with this screwdriver and then he'll lift it up to show Igor hitting him with the hammer and then he'll put it back down to show him stabbing. And then eventually Victor moved up Sergei's body to his head and supposedly you see in the video as Victor stabs Sergei in the eyeball straight through the eyeball and into his brain and apparently you can see his brain when he was killed. Even after all of this Sergei is seemingly still clinging to life he's still moving his arms. In the video you hear Igor saying what he's still alive and Victor replies he's still moving his arms after I ripped up his intestines. Igor then walks further down until he's in line with Sergei's torso and then he begins stamping all over his stomach and then he turns to Victor and says he's having a fucked up day. Meanwhile, through all of this, Victor, the cameraman, is getting all the different camera angles that he can, different zoom-ins on the blood and the injuries and everything. And then after a couple of minutes of this, Victor just says to Igor, kill him already. Igor didn't really listen. And so Victor repeats himself, kill him already. And Igor says, I already put the hammer back. He's already dead. Victor replies, I poked his eyes out and he's still not dead. Get the knife. Instead, Igor just grabs the hammer again and continues beating Sergei over the head with it over and over again as Victor is saying more, more. Finally, when Sergei stops moving and the maniacs are satisfied, with their kill. They then filmed themselves, they didn't stop this recording, they then recorded themselves going back to the car, going in the boot of the car, getting out a water bottle and washing their hands, their faces, everything. And during this part of the clip where the boys are cleaning themselves, they're still talking to each other and they're discussing the murder that they just committed. One of them said this time was awesome and Victor particularly seemed very proud that he had stabbed the screwdriver all the way through his eye and into his brain. He even said, I don't understand how he was still alive. I felt his brain. The recording ends with Igor saying, we must take a picture with him and Victor saying, with him? and Igor saying yes with him for the memory. He then turns to Victor behind the camera and says, do I have any blood on my face? And Victor says, yeah, on your forehead and in your hair. And so Igor continues washing himself and washing his hair with this water bottle. The recording then finishes, but that wasn't even the end of what the boys did. They then went and took pictures with Sergei's body 
And these pictures are online as well, although most of them, especially the ones on Google Images, are blurred. And these pictures include Igor and Victor doing Nazi salutes over the top of Sergei's body. And that was all the information that they gave about that particular murder. And now the boy's still in there questioning. They're giving a little bit of information about some of the kills and way more information about others. So there were a lot of murders that I just kind of skimmed over towards the end of the of part one just because there wasn't much information on them at the time when police found the bodies and things and they couldn't really identify them. But now that they were actually talking to the boys and getting confessions, they could fill in certain gaps and get a little bit more of an idea of what was actually happening with each one. So there was one woman, a 70 year old woman called Lydia, who actually survived an attack by the boys. And she was able to give police quite a lot of information. And she said that she'd been out that day. She was walking her three dogs in the park when the boys attacked her from behind. She said that they hit her once with a hammer to get her to the ground. And then after that, they actually didn't use any weapons at all, which is quite different for Igor and Victor. They, they liked using weapons a lot. But this time, instead of hitting her with a hammer or stabbing her or anything like this, they decided to just take it in turns to kick her in the head and try to loosen her gold teeth because they thought that if they could get her teeth out, then there was value in them, maybe they could sell them. Now the boys said that as they were doing this, as they were kicking this poor 70 year old woman on the ground, they said that her three dogs began attacking them, of course, protecting their owner. So at first they tried just kicking the dogs off, but it wasn't working. And so eventually one of them pulled out a gun that fired rubber pellets and they were shooting these at the dogs and they actually killed two out of three of the dogs. Like I said, luckily Lydia survived this ordeal, but she did have to have like full facial reconstruction surgery after this. So that was pretty much it for the boys' confessions and their versions of events. They didn't give any more information about anything else. So as this case progressed, of course now police had people arrested, the three boys arrested. They felt that they could release more information about it to the public, whereas before, they weren't really telling the public everything because they didn't want to scare them, but there was a lot going on behind the scenes that the public weren't aware of. For example, most of the bodies were actually mutilated beyond just being hit over the head repeatedly. It was actually leaked to the public that some of the bodies were beheaded, they had cut open some of their torsos, they'd ripped apart their intestines, they dismembered them, plucked out their teeth one by one, awful, awful things. Now, following these confessions, police decided to do a full search of each of the boys' homes, just for supporting evidence that could be used in trial, and they found so much evidence. Specifically in Igor and Victor's homes, they went in their wardrobes and looked at their clothes and literally one of the police officers said that there wasn't an item of clothing without some level of blood on it. There was some kind of splash of blood on everything those boys owned. Shoes, socks, t-shirts, everything. Also in this search, police found a pair of earrings believed to belong to one of the victims. They found all those books about Adolf Hitler and the Nazis and all of that. And they also found in Igor's home a collection of newspaper clippings relating to these murders. So he was wanting to relive what he'd done. He was proud of what he'd done. They also found all the hard drives that contained all the photos and the videos of the boys' murders. And of course, they also found the murder weapon itself, that yellow handled hammer. Now, the pictures that police found, they actually had no idea that any of these pictures existed. And there were so many on, on different levels of disrespect as well. There were pictures of them literally over their victims' bodies. There were pictures of them at their victims' grave sites, sticking the middle finger up at their victims' graves. There was even one where the boys had snuck into a morgue and taken a picture of a dead body laying on a table and then sticking the middle finger up at it. Now, I don't think this was one of their murder victims. They didn't seem to have been hit on the head at all. That It wasn't a bloody kind of victim. It just seemed like any kind of dead person that they'd found in the morgue. So many of the pictures of Igor with the swastikas and the toothbrush mustache and everything. Back at the police station, in their questionings, police asked the boys why 
why they had made these videos, these snuff films, believing that the answer that they were probably going to get was for money. They expected that the boys had filmed these things to sell them. However, Igor turned around and simply told them for the memory. There are a lot of rumours in this case about Igor and Victor potentially signing a deal or discussing or negotiating a deal with someone to create these videos and sell them to this person. However, it wasn't mentioned in court. Police didn't really investigate it that much. Some of their school friends and even Victor's girlfriend have said things. I'm not entirely sure what their exact quotes are because, you know, some cases like this, there's a lot of false information out there, but a lot of school friends kind of knew that the boys were in contact with rich people online, like on these dark websites. Again, I don't know how true that is, but, and I don't know, you know, what that really means. Anyway, police just kind of accepted the explanation that they made the videos for the memory. When Igor was asked by the detective how he felt when he committed these murders, Igor simply said, well, how do you feel when you cut a sausage? Which is honestly probably the most chilling thing I've ever heard in my three, four years in this job. After days and days of interrogating the boys and hearing their full confessions, the boys were given over 40 different charges relating to 30 different incidents. This included 21 murders, eight more attempted murders, and a load more just serious injury charges, animal cruelty charges, and robbery charges. Igor was given the most, and then Victor, and then Alexander Hanza was actually only given two charges. Police actually believed Alexander when he said he had no part in the murders. And so these two charges that he was given were for different armed robberies, the armed robberies that he was involved in. Now, I feel like this is a good time to mention that there was actually a fourth boy that was rumoured to be involved in these killings or these crimes. His name was Daniel and he was known to be a close friend of Igor and Victor's and he would hang around with them a lot. Daniel's neighbours knew that he was close with Igor and Victor. They would watch as Igor's green car would come outside the house beep for him and then Daniel would run outside and jump in the car and drive away with the boys. He was close with them. He spent a lot of time with them. Just like his friends, Daniel also had a very rich, powerful, well-connected father. And this might explain why Daniel was actually arrested on the same day that all three of these boys were. However, he was let go on the exact same day that exact same evening. He admitted to his school friends that he had seen the pictures and the videos that Igor and Victor had taken around the murders. He said that he'd also seen all the money and all the phones and the jewelry and everything that they'd stolen from their victims and he knew that they were making money from it. The rumors aren't very clear surrounding Daniel. Some people believe that he was involved in all of the murders and somehow his father was just rich enough and powerful enough to get him off of this completely. Some people believe that he was involved in a couple of the murders, probably not all of them. And some people think that he is just guilty of knowing that all of this was going on and just not contacting the police. Maybe that is why he was arrested. Maybe he was just arrested because he knew things relating to it and he hadn't told the police. Either way, they are just rumours. He wasn't charged, he hasn't served prison time, he's he's actually not officially, you know, a criminal at all. I just thought it was interesting to mention that there was a potential fourth accomplice in this. Now, to this day, Victor and Igor's parents maintain their son's innocence. They believe they did nothing wrong and they did everything that they could with their power and with their connections and with their money to try to get their sons off of their charges. Despite literal confessions from the boys, them telling police in detail what they had done to all of their murder victims, not even mentioning the videos that literally show their faces as they are killing people. Somehow the parents don't believe any of that and they believe that their sons were actually set up by the corrupt police force to give a false confession. They believe that someone else committed these murders and then framed their sons and now police needed someone to quickly blame these murders on and so they beat and forced these two boys to give a confession. The boys' parents have kept in their homes for years 
documents that they believe are fake like they've got fake names on fake dates on stuff like that just like real law documents that they think are faked and they've also been quoted saying that they believe that the videos and the pictures of their sons committing these horrific acts are special effects and photoshop now this is borderline literally impossible <laughs> this was 2007 right now it's probably possible in 2021 to fake a video like that and put someone else's face on it. I mean, it was potentially possible in 2007, but it would have cost so much money. Like even today it would cost a freaking lot of money, but the technology is a bit more accessible now. In 2007, you got to think what phones we were all having in 2007. They were little brick Sony Ericsson's. There was absolutely no way anyone, like a low level criminal was gonna spend the time photoshopping and putting special effects on a video to put their son's faces in a video. I mean, the parents should just believe their son's confessions, really. So all of the boys, all three of them, were given psychiatric evaluations to see if they were in a sound mind when they actually committed the murders. And every single professional that spoke with all three of these boys concluded the exact same thing, that there was absolutely no mental illness, no disabilities. They were completely mentally sound when they committed the murders, which is even more scary because they just did it just because they wanted to and they're very terrifying individuals. So all three of the boys were sent to trial where they all pled not guilty. And I believe it was Victor that actually pled not guilty by reason of insanity. The insanity plea. After the psychiatrics findings that they were completely sane, he tried to plead insanity. During their trial, the boys were kept in what can only be described as a cage throughout the proceedings. Now, I don't know if this is, you know, standard for violent criminals in the Ukraine or, you know, in other countries, but in the UK, I've never seen anything like this before. Criminals aren't held like that in the UK. And I just thought the clips of them in this cage were so mad. Victor Sienko was actually represented. His lawyer was his own father. Like I said, he worked in public prosecutions, very, very powerful man. And his defense for his son was that he was psychologically dependent on Igor. Now, I think this is where the insanity plea comes in, that he was terrified of Igor. He'd supposedly bullied Victor in the past and Victor was so scared of it happening again that he'd made friends with Igor and now he was willing to do anything that Igor said, anything that Igor wanted to prevent Igor turning on him. No one believes this, literally no one. The boys had been friends for so long, there was no sign of any bullying in the past, literally nothing. There was nothing. It seemed as though Victor's father had thought, what angle can I come at this with that's semi-believable? And he just picked that one. There was no evidence behind it really. Now, despite all of their defense lawyers' best efforts, all of the boys were found guilty of their charges. Alexander Hansa, who was believed to have not been involved in the murders, was given nine years for his armed robberies. His two charges of armed robberies, nine years in prison. He's actually since been released in 2019. He's reintegrated back into society and it's actually rumored that he is starting a family. He's got a career, he's starting a family, and he's, you know, got a normal life again. Whereas Victor and Igor, on the other hand, were both sentenced to life in prison. And this was on a bunch of different charges, ranging from murder, animal abuse, literally everything in between, and they will spend the rest of their lives behind bars. Igor has since confessed in jail that he actually intended on continuing his murder spree. You know, if he wasn't stopped by police then, he would have gone on. And he said that his plan was eventually to kill his own parents so that he could use their apartment as his headquarters, his murdering headquarters. The scariest part of this whole case for me is the lack of motivation behind these crimes. People have desperately tried to pin a motivation on these boys because, you know, it is scary to look at a case and think that people are capable of doing this for no reason. People want killers like this to have a reason for doing what they did. People have speculated that they were making the videos for profit, they were paid for them, they had a deal with someone to make these videos, but the fact is that that's just unlikely. The likelihood is that they were just doing this because 
they wanted to kill. They enjoyed killing. They wanted to take lives. They wanted to inflict terror and pain and fear in their victims. And it's hard to accept that there are people like that in the world that want to kill other people and take people's lives for seemingly no reason. Now, the Dnipropetrovsk murders, as they were known, actually went on to inspire a copycat killing or a series of copycat killings by another male killing duo in Russia. So this is pretty much the exact same copy and pasted case. I might do a video on this one day, probably not for a while because it's very similar to this one, but they were known as the Academy Maniacs. They too went and murdered people for seemingly no reason on this really long murder spree with a hammer, just like these guys had. And they also recorded some of the killings on their phones. It's literally like the exact same case. But that is all I have for this video. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a thumbs up down below. I would really appreciate it. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Remember the first 1000 of you guys that go and click the link down below in the description will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. So go snatch it up before they're all taken. Huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. Like I said, if you enjoyed it, leave a thumbs up down below. If you wanna subscribe and see more content like this, you can click the circle right here. If you wanna to subscribe to my second channel, like I said, I'm gonna be uploading so, so much now. Um, click that circle there and if you want to watch another video from me there's a playlist on screen right now bye